this video is going to be about the effects that lithium has on the kidney. And I actually think that grasping the effects that lithium has on the kidney is deceptively simple. And the reason that I think people think it's so complex is because the problems that it causes in the kidney leads to all these problems that are big nephrology words that are scary. For example, some of the things that lithium causes in the kidneys are polyuria, nephrogenic diabetes, insipidus, proteinuria, distal renal tubular acidosis, reduction in the glomerular filtration rate, chronic kidney disease, ESRD or end stage renal disease, interstitial fibrosis, and focal nephron atrophy. So that's a ton of nonsense and you get overwhelmed and then you don't even learn the basics. So I'm gonna make it much simpler. So I have a very, 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 very tiny brain and I can only remember things if they're incredibly simple. So I actually only think that there's one problem that lithium causes with the kidneys, and then the other stuff is just uh, big words that make it more complicated. So as I mentioned, because of the very small brain, I like to create very simple models um, that are useful for me to understand things. So what is the main function of the kidney? Is that it filters the blood, it regulates electrolytes and water levels, removes toxins, and then it excretes the bad stuff into the urine. So to make the kidney as simple as possible, I really break it up into just three parts. Um, you know, it's got to filter the blood, so the blood needs to come in and out. So the first part is just the blood vessel, and that blood vessel is called the glomerulus. So the second part is the renal tubules, and that's where the kidney stuff happens. Like where the electrolytes and salt and glucose and bicarb and uric acid gets secreted and absorbed and stuff. And this part the tubules contains all the weird things that I never remember. There's like limbs and loops and some of them are thin and thick and convoluted, but I would never remember any of that stuff. And then there's the third part and the third part is just the collecting ducts and that's the part that regulates the water. So yeah, my oversimplified version of the kidney, there's three parts. There's the blood flow in and out, that's called the glomerulus. There's the first half that deals with filtration of all electrolytes and bicarb and stuff I don't remember and I don't remember any of their names. And then there's the third part and that's the collecting duct and that just deals with the water. So as I mentioned earlier, there's really only one thing that you really need to remember that lithium causes to the kidneys and everything else will flow from that. And that one thing is diabetes insipidus. So I always think the etymology of things is pretty cool and actually kind of helpful sometimes. So diabetes literally means passer through siphon. Um, so it just means you're peeing too much, right? Things are just going through you. And then the word insipidus literally means tasteless. So it's a cute little comparison to diabetes mellitus, which translates to sweet diabetes, because in diabetes insipidus, you're pissing a ton, but there's not glucose. So it's like a tasteless peeing. So yeah, lithium causes diabetes insipidus, which I'll go into more in a second as to why that is, but that's where the polyurea and the polydipsia come from. So polyurea is just a lot of peeing, and then polydipsia is excessive thirst. And those are intimately related, so you're peeing a ton, so you need to drink to make up for it. So the way that lithium causes this diabetes insipidus, we need to kind of go into a little bit of how the collecting duct works. So the collecting duct is responsible for resorbing the water back into your body. So I think of it as like the water is in the kidneys and then the collecting duct pulls it out of the kidneys and puts it back into the body. So another way to put that is it's responsible for quote unquote like concentrating the urine. So when you pull the water out, it makes whatever is left more concentrated with all those electrolyte solutes and all that nonsense. So the main thing that determines how much water is going to get pulled out of the kidney is what's called ADH or antidiuretic hormone, or it's also called vasopressin. So the way I think about it is that ADH, the antidiuretic hormone, it binds to the collecting duct cells. This signals the cell to pop and put aquaporins onto the collecting duct cells. Aquaporins, like literally aquapore, it's literally like just a little like, I picture it's like a tube that like water can go through. So normally the water just goes straight through the kidneys, but when you tack on those aquapores, then the water gets pulled out of the kidneys. So to recap, the collecting ducts are like tubes without any kind of holes for water to get through. So normally the water just can go straight through those tubes, unless ADH binds to the collecting duct, in which case you get holes in the tubes and then water is pulled out and put back into the body. So this is where lithium causes problems in the kidneys. So we don't even really know lithium's mechanism of action exactly, but you know, the classic phrase you see is it like modulates secondary messenger systems. So in regards to the collecting duct, like I said, ADH binds, and then there's a bunch of processes that occur in the cell, and then aquaporin is put onto the collecting duct. So we know that lithium interrupts that process. So lithium enters the cell, and it interferes with ADH's ability to increase the water permeability. So that's what the core of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus is. So it's an improper response or a resistance to ADH. And 
that leads to a decrease in the ability of the kidney to concentrate the urine because it can't pull the water back into the body. So that's the core of what you need to know. Lithium ingestion leads to ADH resistance, and ADH resistance leads to nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, and that leads to polydipsia and polyuria. So to translate that, you pee and are thirsty a lot because your body stops responding to ADH because of the way lithium interacts with how it works. Now's the part where I explain how all these other crazy nephrology pathology terms are related to the initial problem that I mentioned. So when I said that lithium only causes one problem, what I really meant was that there's only one cause of the lithium problem and then all the other crazy terms are effects of the initial cause. So first let me explain how we measure kidney function and then some of the terms that apply for the level of kidney functioning. So the metric that we typically use to determine how well the kidney is functioning is what we call GFR, which is the glomerular filtration rate, which just describes the flow rate of fluid through the kidney. And I don't want to get too much into the nitty gritty, but we basically look at a particular product in our blood called creatinine, which is released at our, in our body at a constant rate. And by looking at the creatinine, we can estimate the eGFR. So to recap that, if we look at the creatinine in our blood, the creatinine in our blood tells us the glomerular filtration rate, the glomerular filtration rate tells us the flow rate of fluid through the kidney. The flow rate up through the kidney gives us a good idea of how well the kidney is functioning. So if there's a lot of kidney damage, then the kidney can't function that well and you're going to have a low eGFR. And then the lower the eGFR tells us how poorly the kidney is functioning and how much kidney damage there is. Like I guess an okay metaphor would be like, let's say you wanted to say how well a car was working. So you decided to look at the max miles per hour that the car could go on a highway. So if the car can go faster than 60 miles per hour, you have a perfectly functioning car and you're not that worried. But as the car gets more and more damage, it starts going slower and slower. And then at a certain point, like once the car can't go faster than 15 miles per hour, you know the car's useless. You need to replace the car. So the label of chronic kidney disease doesn't tell you what the underlying problem is. It just tells you that the kidney is not functioning as well as it should be. So chronic kidney disease is defined as an eGFR of less than 60. And one thing that's a little confusing is that there are a ton of terms that are kind of all saying the same thing. So like chronic kidney disease is the same thing as chronic renal insufficiency is the same thing as chronic renal failure. They're all just translating to something about the kidney is not functioning that great. And then the term end stage renal disease or ESRD is just like the last stage of chronic kidney disease. So it's when the kidneys are functioning so poorly that they're basically not sustainable for life. So basically when you reach this stage of chronic kidney disease, you're at the end stage, literally. So you're gonna either need dialysis or a kidney transplant. Basically the kidneys aren't functioning, so you need to do something to replace them. So how do we connect the fact that I said that lithium really only does one problematic thing to the kidney and this chronic kidney disease? So as I mentioned before, lithium's main effect is that it causes ADH resistance and then that leads to a nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. So because of the changes that it causes in the cells that ADH bind to, which are the collecting ducts, and the type of cells are called the principal cells, but you don't need to know that, just the collecting duct cells, basically. So it causes the collecting duct cells to remodel, which is responsible for the development of interstitial nephritis and the renal fibrosis. So these big nephrology words sound scary, but they're not. Nephritis, nephra is kidney, itis, inflammation. So you just have inflammation of the kidney. Interstitial refers to interstitium. So the kidney interstitium is basically just the space between the tubules. So it basically just translates to tubule kidney inflammation. And then renal fibrosis is just accumulation of like extracellular matrix components. Fibrosis is the same thing as when you get a scar. So it's an open wound and then connective tissue kind of just takes its place like useless connective tissue. So to translate all this stuff into English, we know that lithium messes up the cells involved in, in ADH. So it messes up the cells in the collecting tubules. Because these cells get messed up, it leads to nephritis. So it leads to inflammation of these cells. Whenever inflammation occurs for too long, fibrosis occurs, which is just the replacement of the useful kidney tissue with essentially scar tissue or junk. So to repeat myself just one more time, the lithium causes nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. This leads to chronic interstitial nephritis, which is just inflammation. This leads to fibrosis, which is just the replacement of the good tissue with the bad tissue. So because there's less good tissue, chronic kidney disease occurs. And that's just saying that the kidneys aren't functioning as well.
The big fear with chronic kidney disease is that it progresses to end-stage renal disease, in which case you need a kidney transplant or dialysis. So I kind of oversimplified things, but this is how I organize all the information in my brain so that it's easy to remember. So it's not like it just causes one problem. And there's actually other things I didn't even mention, but they're much rarer and kind of secondary to all the stuff I've been teaching, but I'll mention them just for, just for mentioning them. So it can lead to a renal tubular acidosis. So because of the tubular defect, the nephron can't maximally acidify the urine. Then there's a nephrotic syndrome, and this is mostly case reports, but it has been very rarely associated with um, minimal change disease. But it's super rare, not entirely clear if it's caused by the lithium. All right, and now I just want to give some percentages so that you have a better idea in your head how often these things occur. So nephrogenic diabetes insipidus occurs in like 20 to 40 percent of patients taking lithium. Now what about the more scary thing, like the chronic kidney disease and the worsening kidney function? So actually, in general, the time that you're on lithium doesn't correlate with your EGFR. There's actually only a subgroup of patients, so 20% of patients, who do show a progressive renal insufficiency. So to translate that, that's like one-fifth of patients have a creeping increase in their creatinine. And then only a percentage of those people actually progress to end-stage renal disease. So the absolute risk of end-stage renal disease is really low, actually. It's like 0.5%. And it really only occurs in patients who've been taking lithium for like 15 plus years. And recent studies have been showing lower and lower rates of end-stage renal disease over the last 30 years. And that's consistent with the fact that we're really using lower levels of lithium. So to summarize, nephrogenic diabetes insipidus is the most common renal side effect. The predominant form of chronic kidney disease is a chronic interstitial nephritis. In general, studies show an infrequent and relatively mild renal insufficiency but end-stage renal disease due to lithium-associated problems does occur in a very, very small percentage of patients. Um, and then just a few quick recommendations for patients who do develop a nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. You should consider starting a mealaride to minimize the lithium accumulation in the collecting tubule cells. Um, guidelines for minimizing risk of significant renal damage is you should be monitoring serum creatinine and EGFR at regular intervals, typically like every six months. Um, obviously, avoid lithium toxicity. Keep the average lithium levels within the lower therapeutic range if it's possible. Um, it's unclear if it's helpful, but once daily dosing might be better than BID dosing. And then consult nephrology if the creatinine gets higher than 1.6. And consideration for discontinuation should be discussed with the patient.